is Mark Freeman, and uh, I have a brain. And so over the years, uh, my brain and I have picked up a bunch of different labels. So depression, addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, management consultant. Uh, at the moment, uh, luckily, I don't struggle uh, with any of these challenges. And so behavioral therapy uh, played a big role in that. But of course, behavioral therapy, if you're not familiar with it, it's really all about change, helping people uh, change behaviors, often cutting out compulsions, and choosing to do things that are aligned with their values that are gonna help them be healthy and happy over the long term. Uh, and that's about change. So change is very difficult. So for the purposes of today's talk, uh, we'll just say I have a brain, because many of you in the audience, I assume, also have brains. And many of you probably also find change very difficult, right? Even if you're not dealing with a health issue, even if you're not trying to change your behavior uh, so completely from a compulsion to not engaging in compulsion, change is really tough. And here's the problem with uh, behavioral therapy, and it's really that change is difficult. So when we're looking at research on behavioral therapy for mental illnesses, we often see numbers like these. So this was a study uh, done on dialectical behavioral therapy uh, for people struggling with borderline personality disorder. And you'll often see a number just like that up there at the top. 40% of patients didn't even finish the study. Now of those that finished, 77% are no longer classified as having BPD. Right, so that's, that's fantastic. Of course, in some ways, the researchers have massaged the numbers a bit there because 77% is actually around 46%. Right? 46% of the people who took the study uh, actually recovered. And we see this consistently in many different types of therapy, exposure and response prevention. You always have this large chunk of people, around 30 to 40% of people, uh, who aren't going to finish the study or they show up as non-responders. And the thing is with behavioral therapy, if you're a non-responder, that probably actually means you weren't able to do the exercises. So you're going to see the therapist each week, uh, but in reality you weren't able to do the exercises. They were too difficult. And I can tell you from personal experience, the reason for that is uh, when you're doing behavioral therapy, it feels like your brain is going to jump out of your skull. It is going to go and find a far better host who is going to feed it the compulsions it wants. It does not want to stay in there. It's an incredibly, quite viscerally painful experience. And so it's very, very difficult to make those changes. Now, luckily, uh, when I was doing therapy, uh, I was doing exposure and response prevention therapy. That's kind of how I got started on the journey of recovery. And luckily at the time I was working, uh, I was in grad school, and I was working with uh, a guy by the name of Tom Wujek. And Tom is a designer. He's, uh, he facilitates design thinking workshops. He has a bunch of popular TED Talks. Uh, he has a great one out there on drawing how you make toast. Check it out. It has like, you know, millions and millions of views. And Tom works with companies, very large companies all over the world, helping them create innovative products and services. And so I started doing workshops with Tom just as I was starting to do therapy. And when we would go into you know, a corporate boardroom, working with the CEOs and et cetera, uh, Tom would put up this diagram at the very beginning of the session. And it's the unhappiness curve. And so U stands for unhappiness, T is for time. And the reason we would put this up is because when any group of people starts to innovate and starts to change, the moment they start to make changes, they start to go up the unhappiness curve. So and particularly when I'm talking with people about mental health, uncertainty increases. You can also consider that the U means uncertainty. Uncertainty goes up, unhappiness goes up, and what do people do? They fall back on what they've done before. And so we see companies do this all the time. In many ways, companies often struggle with anxiety disorders. Right? They make short-term decisions uh, to relieve anxiety at the long-term expense of the health and success of the company. But this is exactly what I was doing with mental illness. I would start to experience feelings I didn't like, and then I would quickly do a lot of things to make those feelings go away. I would drop down off the unhappiness curve. And so when we were working with companies, we would tell them basically the entire role of us coming in as a design thinking consultants was to help that team make it up the unhappiness curve. So help that team experience a whole lot of feelings they don't like so that they could get the top and actually innovate. And so it occurred to me that this was exactly what I needed to do because recovery from mental illness uh, required me to innovate in a very real sense. I was having to do things that I could not imagine were possible. I'd lived my entire life uh, with all these compulsions. I couldn't imagine not having them there. Uh, so that's really when a therapist was asking me to make a change, they were asking me to innovate. But the problem is with behavioral therapy, as you saw, there are a lot of people drop out because if you go into your therapist 
or your doctor or who, whomever, and you know, you're gonna see them maybe if you're lucky for an hour, and they tell you, go home and make this change. Uh, you don't have, you, know, you don't go back to IDEO and have all the IDEO consultants help you figure out how you're gonna make that change in your life. You don't have design thinking consultants making, helping you do that. Uh, and so that's very difficult to do on our own. So what I'd suggest today is hopefully you just walk away uh, from this presentation, it's gonna be quite short, but just with some curiosity. So particularly if you already are sold on design thinking, you already get that, you know what, design is incredibly useful, it helps us make innovative products, it helps us in our hospital actually create change. How could your patients or you yourself be using design thinking tools and principles to support that process of change? And so I'm gonna give you uh, two quick examples. And so the first one uh, is basically uh, an adaptation of the journey map. So this is an example from Stanford's D School. They have a video online if you're not familiar with the journey map uh, on how to do this. You might also see it called a customer journey. And basically it's about visualizing uh, a customer or a user's experience with your product or service. And so see this is following a person on how they make a purchasing decision about coffee. And I love the journey map working with companies because you see innovative opportunities to create products. You understand why people aren't connecting with your product or service. Uh, you can see other ways within the system of their lives uh, to create value, to create something that's going to be useful to them. So we can adapt this to mental health in something I call the compulsion journey. And so with the compulsion journey, so let's say we had somebody, a hypothetical person, uh, they uh, struggle with compulsive behaviors around staying up all night watching kitten videos. At all times throughout the day, they're just constantly watching kitty and kitten videos. They're frustrated by this. It's making them tired. They're not able to do the things they want to do. They're really struggling with this. So they may come in uh, you know, to their therapist, uh, to their doctor, and say, here's the problem. But what we want to know is the complete system that led up to that problem. So just like with a customer journey, we would draw out their day. So all the different things that happened throughout the day, uh, all the way back to the moment they woke up in the morning. And then we would ask that patient uh, to tell the story of that day. Right, so they, you know, they woke up, they were already tired, they already had tons of messages on their phone, they were late for work, they didn't have time to make breakfast, they had to rush into work. When they got to work, there was all of this work from the other days that they'd been procrastinating on that was still sitting there. They were stressed out, they got stuck in a meeting in the morning, uh, they had, didn't have time to prepare lunch, so they had to eat this you know, really expensive salad. They did enjoy one thing during the day, which was chatting with one of their colleagues. Uh, you know, then they commute home, they get home, they're stressed about the day, they turn their computer on as soon as they get home, but they still have to do all that work that they were procrastinating on all day. They don't have time to make dinner, uh, so they just grab some pizza, they're very lonely again, you know, stuck at home. And you know, this is the point uh, where I used to always do things that I, that I would call addict math. And that's when you're struggling with a compulsion, you start to come up with all these rational reasons why you deserve your compulsion right now, why really you should engage in the compulsion. So there'd be some addict math, and then boom, it's 2 a.m., uh, and they're back watching kitten videos all night again. And they're frustrated, and they're like, oh, I wanted to cut this out. And so the reason we look at something like this is because it shows interesting opportunities to make changes that are easier. So something I would be looking at in this kind of system is the moment they turned on the computer that actually that's where the compulsion started. And we know from having this patient draw this out, uh, we know what they were actually happy about during the day. Right, there was that one moment where they were talking to somebody. They actually enjoyed interacting with somebody. So now we know, so instead of maybe turning on the computer as soon as they get home, how can we set up opportunities to be around other people at night? So they're not lonely during the night and thinking, okay, I'm really lonely right now. I need my compulsions to relieve that loneliness. So that shifts the focus of the change. We're no longer trying to stop that behavior over there. We're actually trying to change to do something the patient actually likes. Right? So I would argue that often creates opportunities uh, for change that are easier. This kind of system also shows us bigger systemic problems. Right, so we know this person, uh, right from when they woke up in the morning, uh, they were tired, they were stressed, they were behind on their work. So why is that? Right, because if we don't tackle those kinds of issues, right, that they're always behind on the work, they think, oh, I have to stay home tonight and finish all that work so I don't have time to go and see people. So if we don't also tackle changes around why they're procrastinating, why they're struggling at work, they're always gonna find themselves stuck in this position. And so we have to tackle those bigger issues and a, tool like the compulsion journey helps us see that. 
Uh, so why is this helpful? Like I was just talking about there, it makes systems visible. You can actually see the complete problem uh, rather than just focusing on the symptoms that might be bothering us. Uh, it makes changes tangible. So this one's really important. This is something we would always do with companies uh, when we were doing some kind of design thinking workshop. Uh, when people have ideas and we just talk about them, it can become very personal. If I disagree with your idea, it can look like I'm attacking you. And so think about this when it comes to patients. If I'm a patient and I have to go in and I have to talk about a problem I'm having, it's like I'm the problem and we're gonna fix me. But if I can draw out that problem and we can look at it objectively and put it up on a wall, uh, then we can talk about fixing that problem. And that can become much easier. It can become much easier for a patient to be honest about it. Okay? And the other thing uh, is that it makes it easier to tell stories. And telling stories is so important because often when we're struggling to make a change, it can seem like we're non-compliant. So a patient comes in, ah, you know, it was too difficult, I couldn't make that change, the doctor's upset, the therapist is upset, here we have a non-compliant patient again. But the reality is when we look at the complete system and we tell the story of that, you see that probably that change or that type of therapy was impossible given the context in the system which in which they operated, right? And so that's not clear unless we tell stories, right? So those are all some design thinking principles uh, that are very useful to apply. There's two other big design thinking principles that uh, I think often people, now empathy totally makes sense. Like, yeah, you wanna have empathy, but I think prototyping is an interesting design thinking principle that people often don't think about bringing in uh, to the mental health sector. Uh, but I bet everybody or most of you have in your pocket or probably sitting right in front of you or you're on it right now, you have this amazing prototyping and empathy tool for mental health. Because how many people do things like this? Right, cell phone in bed, cell phone on the toilet, cell phone while you're eating lunch while also working on the computer at the same time. Right, so a lot of us do this. How many of you, so go for a show of hands here, how many of you have heard this beep or felt it buzz only to pull it out and see that there was no message. How many people, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, right? That's very normal. Uh, research on this, on the phantom beep, uh, so there's been one study done on nurses, one study done on students by 90% of people. Hear it buzz, uh, hear it beep, uh, feel it buzz and pull it out, right? And so that's a delusion, right? We call it an auditory hallucination, right? Most people experience that, right? And they react to it. So the great thing you see right there uh, is that you can have empathy for what it's like to experience a delusion. Right? So when I struggled with mental illness, uh, I struggled with all sorts of delusions. And so one of them was that my water bottle uh, had been poisoned. And so I was always engaging in all sorts of compulsions around my water bottle, checking it, not drinking from it, being like, oh, okay, I think no, somebody definitely just poisoned it so I can't drink out of it. So when uh, I'm working with a therapist then and they tell me, okay, we need to have you not engage in these compulsions. Right, so what they're asking me to do at that moment by not engaging in those compulsions and drink out of that poison water bottle, which I believe is poison in the same way that you thought you heard your cell phone ring, right? it's that real. What they're asking me to do there is incredibly difficult because how many of you, when you just heard that, that phone beep, thought, oh, okay, that's not a real beep, I don't have to check it. Right, it's incredibly difficult to see through a delusion like that. And that's really what we're asking people do, to do there. The, uh, the other uh, way that the cell phone is incredibly useful is that you can prototype change. And so what I mean by that um, is that you can practice not checking your phone when you get the urge to check it. And so that really captures all the elements of a change that we're asking a person to make uh, on a much simpler scale. Because right? you probably, when you checked your phone, when you heard it beep, uh, you probably didn't think, if I don't check this, I might die. And so often when someone, we're doing behavioral therapy with somebody, we start it with these very difficult changes right? that can be very stressful for the patient. Uh, but the reality is, just learning how to not check your phone uh, captures all the elements of change that are involved in behavioral therapy for much bigger issues. Right? So, and so I would uh, challenge everybody here to try this. Right? To feel the urge, you know, think about a reason why you want to check your phone. You don't even have to hear it ring. Because uh, all the time we're just feeling, oh, maybe I'll check this. I'll see if I got a message. Feel that urge, recognize that it's there, and then choose to do something else that you value. And I always encourage uh, patients to do this. 
Uh, so now I work in a peer support role, so this is always the first exercise we start with. Uh, I also encourage therapists to try this, or healthcare practitioners. And this is really for anything. If you're asking a patient to make a change, make sure that you understand how to make changes too, because it is incredibly difficult. Uh, making change is really like learning how to run a marathon. Right? So recovery from mental illness is incredibly difficult. It's very difficult to make those changes unless you can make a tiny change. Right? So unless you can run one mile, it's very difficult to run 22 miles. Right? So we need to start small. And likewise, if you're a healthcare practitioner, you know, make sure that if you're telling somebody to run a marathon, that you know how to run a marathon too. Right? And so you can start with something small, like just learning how not to check your cell phone when you get the urge to check. Right? So uh, this, of course, is useful. Uh, like, just like I was mentioning there, um, it's very difficult to accept big uncertainties until you learn to accept small ones. And you can build empathy. Right? Change is very difficult. We all know that. Uh, and so keep in mind, you know how difficult change is, uh, that when you're asking patients to make changes, uh, they're going to struggle uh, to the same extent that you would struggle. And you know, there's a good chance, particularly with mental illness, that that patient probably believes they're going to die if they make the changes you're suggesting. Right? So that's very tough. Patients take on uh, very difficult challenges uh, when it comes to recovery from mental illness. Okay, so uh, that brings me to the end. Good luck with not checking your phones. All right, thank you. Awesome, great job, Mark. Uh, thank you. We have five minutes now for questions. You can find me. Comments or thoughts or uh, related stories that came to mind? Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I was listening to a seminar that we had talking about how some reactions don't make any sense. So you have to kind of think about that. Thinking about that. Totally, totally. I mean, the uh, particularly with design thinking. So even some of these exercises at first can seem a bit odd if you're doing them in a clinical setting, because often we just have a person come in and we just talk to them. And so one of the great things to do right from the beginning is start to articulate some of those things. Uh, because yeah, often we just treat each patient that comes in in the same way. Uh, so getting those goals out, making those visible uh, before you dive into something is yeah, absolutely incredibly useful. Uh, so, I mean, the, the great thing is that patients can do that. So when I'm doing this as a, you know, a task with people I'm working with in, when it, in a peer support setting, uh, patients do it, clients do it on their own. Uh, so the great thing is that, yeah, drawing these things out, uh, and it's particularly a great thing to do right after they've engaged in that compulsion. Uh, so this is kind of a task that would normally give us homework. Uh, and so the advantage there is that then they're coming in with the kind of the system already mapped out. And uh, it is something you can do in a clinical setting. It does, it, that exercise usually takes about 25 minutes uh, to go through. Uh, the great thing is that it's, it, it, on a superficial level, it seems different from every person. But with each person, you're looking for some consistent things, just like if you were working with a business. Uh, you're looking for opportunities to change that are easier. Uh, so you're really looking for where the compulsion starts. And there's always going to be that earlier point where things are a bit easier. And then you're looking for opportunities, so things that that person really likes to do and really cares about. Um, and so again, so you have that opportunity to make change. And then you're always looking, going, you may have missed it, there's a thing called the, un the unhappiness curve. Uh, okay, yeah, so the feelings they don't like. So you're looking for that too. 
because you know that point where they're experiencing the feelings they don't like, uh, like that person was struggling with loneliness there, uh, and probably some anxiety, some frustration about work. So what are the supports you can put in place to help them with handling that feeling they don't like? Um, and so for each person, those feelings might change, but the principle of helping them up and over that curve uh, stays the same with each one. Thanks.